All right. Well, welcome, everybody. I am Christina Clayton. I am one of the co-directors of the Northwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. And welcome to today's webinar, Opioids, Overdose, and Naloxone Administration with Sean Hemmerly with the Washington State Department of Health. We're so grateful so many of you could join us to learn more about this important topic. But first and foremost, our land acknowledgement. The Northwest MHTTC honors the many cultures and lands across our region spanning Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. And we're sited in Seattle and we sit on the traditional land of the Duwamish and Coast Salish peoples. We're honoring with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it through the generations. If you haven't heard of us before, it's your first event with us. The MHTTC network is a nationwide network that is supported by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, otherwise known as SAMHSA. So we're part of a large network. There's also an addiction uh, technology transfer network and a prevention technology transfer network. And our goals are to support mental health related evidence-based practices, heighten awareness, knowledge, and skills of the workforce, foster regional and national alliances, and provide and connect you to free training and technical assistance like today. Our Northwest MHTTC is based out of the University of Washington in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. And our region is, as I said, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Alaska. Our focus area is evidence-based practices for serious mental health issues such as psychosis, but we provide training on a variety of topics. And our workforce is really anyone who has work in or affects the mental health of their constituents. How do we fulfill our mission? We have live events like this webinar, we record and post, we have learning communities, free self-paced online courses, newsletters and resource library on our website, and we connect you to other training centers and events. So if you wanna find out more, please visit our website and sign up for our newsletter. A little bit about language. It's always our intention to be mindful of using language that promotes recovery and culturally appropriate terminology. And I think today, specifically with topics related to substance use, this can really hit home and it's important that we think about our words regarding this subject as well. So we have this slide that our network uses, but our team will also be putting in another reference for how to use more person-first language um, in the substance use arena. Next, some logistics regarding communication. Obviously you are muted and you're not appearing on video because it's a webinar. Um, the presentation is being recorded. The recording and slides will be made available on our website. You'll receive an email from Zoom with a link to where we post those. We don't have formal CEUs, but we do have uh, certificates of attendance if you'd like to get those. So you'll get another email about that in a couple of weeks if you'd like to request one of those. Yeah. If you have any technical issues or a non-content related question, feel free to put that in the chat and our team will assist you. If you have a content related question for Sean, please put that in the Q and A box. I will be queuing those up as we go along. And Sean has graciously said that I can interrupt at a, an opportune time when you have a question that relates to where he's at in the presentation and we'll also do questions at the end. If you put a question that sure looks like a question in the chat, we can't actually copy and paste it for you. So we'll have to probably reply and say, can you put it in the Q and A? So off we go. Evaluation. It's so important that we hear from you about how you feel our session went. And so it would be great if you could you know, spend just a couple of minutes to take a short survey right after the session. We'll put a link in the chat and we'll get a reminder uh, tomorrow from Zoom. We are required to conduct the survey, but just no joke, we look at all these reports, they are confidential, we can't identify specific people, um, but really knowing how each of our events went and what you'd like to see in the future is really, really helpful and we do examine those. We wanna keep that free training coming. You know, kind of content uh, disclaimer, SAMHSA sponsors this work, but does not reflect any official position on this content. And now to the good stuff. So very grateful that Sean was willing to come and talk to us about opioids, overdose, and naloxone administration. Again, during the webinar, we might post links that may have be interest to you, uh, either provided by Sean or the team. But before we move on to our conversation with Sean and introductions, we wanted to do a couple of polls to get to know who's in the audience. I think our team will launch one of the polls now. 
So tell us about you. So can you please choose the option that best describes your role? And I know you can't see the answer uh, responses just yet. So I'll be narrating this like it's some sort of a uh, race. <laughs> so we're having a pretty even split between um, who's out there. We have, uh, and then you also have, yeah, what's your work setting? So thank you. So what's your role? What's your work setting? And just give another minute or so for that too. Hold up. A lot of case managers, outreach workers, education. Nice to see some peer support folks. And of course, we always, you know, hate that category other <laughs> because there's so many things that don't fit into these neat little tidy boxes, but we appreciate it. Okay, we'll give you just another second. And why don't we go ahead and close this poll and uh, see the results. Okay. So we have a um, pretty good split, but certainly uh, most in the case manager other and um, a lot in the behavioral health setting and other related settings and the others. So, all right. Now we have one more poll. I thought this would be interesting given the topic of naloxone. Do you have this in your workplace? Because I remember when my former workplace started to have this, and it's been a number of years now, but it's still for some settings controversial or unclear. So that's why we thought it was so important that Sean was here today talking about it. So looks like there's a majority, yes, but not quite a large majority, just over half and still about 38% no. Okay, why don't we go ahead and stop that and we'll share. All right, so you can see still some folks out there that don't have access to this in their workplace. So um, I think that's very interesting and you're working on it and maybe you don't know. Those are good, good things to know too. All right. So I'm very happy to introduce our presenter, Sean Hemmerly. He is the overdose education and naloxone distribution consultant at the Washington State Department of Health. He facilitates statewide naloxone distribution to organizations that work with people at risk of experiencing or witnessing overdoses. Before joining DOH in 2019, Sean worked as a community health outreach worker for the Tacoma Needle Exchange. And if I'm correct, Sean, that was the first needle exchange in the country. It was the first syringe exchange program to receive government funding. Ah, thank you, um, thank you. There, there were a couple more that, that preceded TNE that worked underground or didn't receive government funding, but yeah. Sure, it's a, it's a notable difference, but thank you. I knew we had some uh, history yeah. here in Tacoma. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> he received a BA in cultural anthropology and social welfare in 2017 from the Evergreen State College. And we're very happy to have you. And just wanted to have a little conversation before we get into your um, presentation. So um, we'll just roll with this. And I think we don't usually get to ask this of people. So we're excited to do this. Um, was there a key moment that led you into this role or this position um, in doing naloxone distribution and this kind of work? Um, I don't know about a key moment. Uh, like you mentioned, you know, I worked for a number of years at the Tacoma Needle Exchange where I got to. Um, distribute many naloxone kits and I got to hear the the stories that our participants shared with us you know about how you know they were able to save lives by having naloxone available you know naloxone kits that we had provided to them and you know just um, the feeling that they that they gave you know like you know many of them you know you know seemed really empowered by, you know, the, the fact that they um, could save a life or many lives. You know, we, we had, you know, many participants who have saved many lives, you know, um, and I myself was saved with naloxone back in the uh, uh, early 90s. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't be here without it. Wow, thank you. So it's been around far longer than it's 
been in local agencies and becoming more part and parcel of, of what is in part of our, our safety kit. Um, so that's good to know. How does overdose prevention align with harm reduction principles? And we might throw a couple of links into our chat here, but um, for those that maybe are familiar with harm reduction principles or maybe aren't, how does this fit into that? Sure. Well, harm reduction, when we you know look at it from a substance use frame, you know, it's all about, you know, using whatever substances, substance or substances that you're about to do, using them in the safest, in the safest and healthiest way possible. And what we're seeing right now with regards to illicit fentanyl and the way that it's sort of found its, its way into many of the drugs that are being sold on the street, um, it doesn't matter what you're using nowadays, be it heroin or methamphetamine or cocaine, um, you should all, always be prepared to respond to an opioid overdose because there is a very real possibility that fentanyl has found its way into whatever you're about to take. And naloxone will reverse the effects of a fentanyl overdose. So what I hear you saying is regardless of your, your substance of choice, you might be at risk for getting an overdose because of the fentanyl making its way into all of these substances exactly. on the street. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's an, a very important thing for people to really know. Uh, we can't really have silos of this kind of user, or that kind of substance preference. Um, it's messy right now and dangerous, life-threatening. Yeah. How do racial justice and health inequities issues intersect with opioid use and or service approaches? Wondered what your thoughts are on that. Well, it's a... Uh... I would say, you know, for those of us who are old enough to remember um, the quote unquote crack cocaine epidemic of the late 80s and early 90s, and the way we approached that um, is much different from the way that we're approaching opioid use currently and and substance use currently. Um, Back then it was, you know, framed much more, you know, from a criminal legal approach. And, you know, we saw many people getting locked up for, you know, you know, some, for great lengths of time. Um, now it's, you know, due to, you know, the, you know, the different complexion of the, of the skin on the face of the, you know, your average user, um, at least with what's being shown on, you know, media and television. Um, opioid use and substance use is being approached from uh, a more medical, you know, perspective. And, and that, you know, could have to, you know, could very well be because, you know, we don't have the medications to um, address stimulant use like we do with opioids, you know, in the form of methadone or buprenorphine, suboxone. Um, However, we could have taken a more medical approach (laughs) Regardless, you know, back then, you know, and unfortunately, you know, there, there's many folks who are still in, in prison, you know, to this day, you know, due to the, the tactic, tactics that were in place back then. So, yeah, that's so really it's uh, making generalizations here, but a, a wider group using opioids and therefore getting a much more. Yeah. Uh, medicalized response and lots of money pouring in. And at the same time, we have really forgotten a lot of other communities. And that's not to say that opioid use doesn't affect communities sure. of color. Absolutely. Um, you know, primarily um, Native American communities are, Native American p- communities are especially hard hit when we look at um, the overdose rates, you know, in proportion to uh, population rates. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, opioid use and um, opioid overdose is affecting everyone right now. It doesn't matter the color of your skin or your race, ethnicity, where you live, you know, your income, occupation. Great, thank you. Sure. But history matters, you know, that's, uh, it's helpful if you do have that perspective that we are taking a different approach and um, everyone's at risk. So we need to keep going. Um, Wondering, you know, we're coming from the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, wondered 
what you see as how does a person's mental health affect their vulnerability to opioid use and or the effects of opioid use? And is there anything that's different or something we should know as providers or community members when people have mental health issues as well and are intersecting with opioids? Sure. Um, uh, and I'll touch on this in my presentation uh, as well, but um, opioids are not only a physical painkiller, they are a fantastic emotional painkiller. Um, you know, they're, you know, for many, they are a, an antidepressant, you know, even though they're not technically considered such. Um, and those with, you know, serious mental health issues or, you know, um, those who have experienced trauma in the past or are experiencing trauma currently, um, opioids can be a fantastic way of addressing and relieving that, you know, the mental pain, emotional pain, uh, pain associated from trauma, both, both physical and mental. Um, so, you know, don't be surprised if you are a mental health provider and you have patients who, you know, even though they might not have <clears throat> physical pain that needs to be addressed, um, they are using opioids because they are very good at relieving, you know, emotional and mental pain. Great, thank you. And then lastly, are there any approaches to substance use treatment or overdose prevention right now that you find encouraging on the horizon? Uh, sure. Um, Canada is doing some fantastic work regarding um, safe supply. And safe supply simply is where um, government typically would step in and provide a regulated and controlled um, substance to someone who needs it. And this could be in the form of stimulants, it can be in the form of opioids. Um, Canada is looking at providing um, prescription stimulants in the form of amphetamines, uh, possibly cocaine as well. Um, prescription opioids in the form of uh, Dilaudid and possibly heroin. Um, countries over in Europe have been doing prescription heroin for many years. Switzerland has been doing it since 1994. And Switzerland, as some of us know, is a very, very conservative country, um, yet they have medicalized heroin. Um, here in Washington, uh, we're seeing a great increase in low barrier buprenorphine prescribing. Um, there are some syringe service programs that have few prescribers on site. And so someone who is visiting the syringe service program to obtain uh, new injection supplies can also meet with a prescriber and get, in, get inducted on the buprenorphine um, that, during that same visit, uh, depending on their ability to you know, take the buprenorphine. I mean, some people might not be able to, to take it right then and there due to the presence of opioids in their system. But uh, yeah, you know, we, we are, we're, we're making headway, but um, you know, there's a lot more work that we can do. All right. Well, with that, we will absolutely let you get to your uh, presentation. Thank you for talking with us. I will go ahead and uh, stop my screen sharing and let you get to yours. So thank you. And we'll chat throughout the presentation if people put in questions. So just another shout out, put them in the Q&A box. And uh, I will ask Sean to answer them. Thank Sounds you so good. much. Sure. Okay, so folks, give me one second here. I'm gonna get my uh, presentation up here. Okay, so here we go. We're going to talk today about opioids, overdose, and naloxone. We are going to touch on some other items as well, some topics re related to drug use and the health and well-being of drug users. I realize we did a land acknowledgement um, at the beginning of the presentation, but I would like to give my own uh, before we start. I'm in Tacoma as the presenter of this training for our community members. This is the traditional home of the tribe we know today as the Puyallup tribe of Indians. I honor and thank their ancestors and leaders who have been stewards of these land and water since time immemorial. Again, that's me and my contact info. If any of you would like to stay in touch, 
after this presentation, uh, please feel free to take down my uh, email and reach out. I'm happy to discuss anything that you know I touch on and present on, or any or talk about any any other matters related to drug user health. These are our goals for today. We're going to talk about what an opioid is, what, what are opiates, what happens during an overdose. We'll look at some current overdose trends and naloxone laws here in Washington. We'll talk about some risk factors associated with overdose and how to recognize and respond to an opioid overdose. I, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have time to touch on stimulant overdoses. Um, however, um, I do encourage you to look into uh, how to recognize and respond to one because we are seeing a strong uptick in stimulant overdoses, not only here in Washington state, but across the country. We'll talk about post overdose care, meaning you know you gave the person naloxone, you revived them, they've woken up, now what do you do? We'll look at some tools for finding naloxone in your area. We'll look at how to store naloxone and Pardon me, I need to move this bar blocking. There we go. All right. Uh, I'll talk about how to store naloxone and finally, any agency specific rules uh, or guidelines that you might have if you get at your place of business. So, opiates and opioids, what are they? Well, they're, for one, they are considered an analgesic, meaning they are a painkiller. They are fantastic at taking away physical pain. People, there is a reason why people why people take these things and why they're prescribed. They are very, very good at relieving physical pain. Like I mentioned in the Q&A before, they're really good at taking away, you know, emotional pain and psychological pain as well. You know, folks who have experienced trauma in the past or who are experiencing um, mental illness currently or, or have in the past, opioids, can sometimes address those issues. They're considered also a central nervous system depressant, meaning they slow down your breathing. You have these receptors in your brain called mu receptors, and opioids attach to those receptors. And those receptors are also the receptors that tell your body to breathe. So if you take too much of an opioid, those receptors get overwhelmed and your breathing shuts down. And that, in a nutshell, is what causes an overdose. The term opiate is used to refer to substances where the active ingredient is derived from nature. Okay. Now, this would include drugs like morphine and cocaine because the active ingredient comes from the opium poppy. Heroin would be considered semi-synthetic because it does contain a processed um, a processed active ingredient. Synthetic opiates would be considered opioids. These are ones where the active ingredient is created by a human. So this would be, drugs in this class would be uh, fentanyl, dilaudid, methadone. Oxycodone would be considered a semi-synthetic. However, don't get too bogged down in the terminology. At the end of the day, it's an opiate or opioid, they're gonna do the same thing to the, to the body, all right? They both attach to that same brain receptor. They both trigger euphoria. They can cause nausea in people, drowsiness. Again, they're really good at relieving physical and emotional pain. They do slow down the breathing. They can cause constipation in some folks. Also a slowed reaction time. And many people will experience a nod when they take them. Uh, a nod can best be described as a, like a 10 or 15 second nap where the person just simply, you know, nods in and out of consciousness. People can nod while they're standing up. Concern about taking opioids lies in the fact that if you take them for a length of time, be it a couple days, a couple weeks, or even longer, your body winds up developing a physical need for them. All right? Some people call this addiction. Some people call it dependence. But in a nutshell, it's a physical need. 
because your body already produces its own opioid called dopamine. Yet when you introduce an outside source of opioids, say in the form of heroin or Percocet or Vicodin, well, your body winds up taking a vacation and simply doesn't produce the same level of dopamine as it did before. And if that outside source gets cut off, say your doctor won't prescribe any more Dilaudid to you, or you can't find your heroin dealer that morning, well, your body can't simply produce enough dopamine to get you back to level immediately. It's going to take some time. And that process is referred to sometimes as kicking dope or being dope sick, going through withdrawal. But in a nutshell, it's just because your body can't, you know, get you back to normal right away. You know, it's going to take some time. And that length of time can depend on a lot of things. It depends on the strength of the opioids that you've been taking, the route of administration, how much have you been taking each day and night. That's also the riskiest time for someone, or one of the riskiest times for someone to overdose because their tolerance level is, is wavering. And if they wind up taking too much at once during that period of time where they're you know, leveling out, they are at risk of overdosing. So fentanyl uh, is the you know, flavor of the month, so to speak. Um, some people would say it's the flavor of the year or even longer. Uh, many of you have seen or heard or read about fentanyl in your buzz feeds and your news feeds and your social media feeds. Many of you might um, be familiar with fentanyl from having used it in the past or having worked with folks who currently use it or have used it in the past. We're gonna talk a little bit about, you know, some of the facts and myths about fentanyl and, you know, why we are concerned about it. Licit fentanyl, meaning the fentanyl that you would be prescribed in a hospital or clinical setting, this has been around for a long time, you know, going on 30, 40 years, you know, it was developed back in the 60s. And it was designed to address breakthrough pain. Breakthrough pain is pain that folks experience when they're going through circumstances like end-stage cancer pain or HIV wasting syndrome, pain that manages to break through all of the opioid medication that they're already taking. And we're talking about people who are taking like, you know, copious amounts of opioids throughout the day and night, yet they still manage to experience pain. Fentanyl was designed to address this. It comes on very quickly. Depending on the route of administration, meaning the way that you took it, the effects can be felt in as little as three to five minutes. It's very potent, meaning very strong. It's measured in, in, in micrograms, meaning a millionth of a gram. And it goes away fast. The effects you know, don't stick around for very long. The effects, depending on the amount that you took, can go away in anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes or so. Um, however, if you, if you took it with a transdermal patch, those patches are designed to be um, absorbed over the course of a couple of days, about 72 hours or so. But if you took it in the form of like a lozenge or an injection, the effects will go away rather quickly, meaning it has a short half-life. And yes, in the clinical setting, it can be administered via the transdermal patch, meaning a patch that you put on your uh, on your upper outer uh, bicep or up by your shoulder. It could be a lozenge, like a lollipop, a uh, sublingual spray, meaning a spray that you spray underneath your tongue. And again, you know, it's very potent. You know, this stuff is very good at addressing breakthrough pain. It's the illicit forms that we're most concerned about because this is the stuff that's being, you know, not manufactured in a controlled setting. Um, it's being sold on the street in unknown purity, unknown, um, unknown potency. It's also synthetic. We're finding it in uh, things being sold on the street like heroin, uh, counterfeit pills. Primarily here in Washington, what we're seeing is that it's being sold in the form of blue pills that, that are stamped with an M, like Michael, and 30. And they're being marketed as Percocets. However, nearly everyone that's been um, found and tested, it's been shown to have fentanyl in it. 
Uh, we're also seeing it um, somewhat in, in the methamphetamine supply. Not very much, but we are seeing it though. In the cocaine supply and other street drugs like, uh, um, like fake Xanax bars, we've also seen it in those as well. Um, the reasons uh, behind you know, why we're finding it in some of these drugs that are not opioids, um, it's anyone's guess. You know, since it's so you know potent, it could be a simple matter of someone who who bagged up a bunch of heroin on a table, and then went to go bag up a bunch of methamphetamine afterwards, and simply didn't clean the table. And that heroin might have had some fentanyl in it, might have simply transferred over to the methamphetamine, or it could be intentional. We just don't know. The best way I can describe for you why people are overdosing from this stuff is I want you to picture a packet of sugar, all right? Practically everyone in this group has seen a packet of sugar before. Those packets weigh roughly three grams, okay? In a clinical setting, and I'm gonna do a little bit of math here for you. Um, it's simple math, you should be able to keep up. I went to Evergreen, so my math is not great, but I was able to do this. In a clinical setting, the lowest dosage that you would be given of fentanyl is 100 micrograms, all right? Now, 100 micrograms, not enough to cause an overdose for most everybody. However, 400 or 500 micrograms, very well might, or more, very well might, okay? Now, again, that packet of sugar, three grams. You can make 30,000 100 microgram doses out of that one packet of sugar. Now, again, 100 microgram dose of fentanyl, probably not enough to cause an overdose. However, 300, 400, 500 micrograms, very well might. And you can imagine the difficulty at it, you know, there is in measuring out a single dose out of that packet of sugar, right? This is simply why folks are overdosing. They can't measure out a safe dose, right? Um, I mean, if they can, you know, more power to them. But for the average street level opioid user uh, or street level drug user, it's, it's near impossible. Another reason we're concerned about illicit fentanyl is that it chocolate chips, meaning I want you to picture a chocolate chip cookie. Pretend that the cookie is the heroin or the cutting agent and the chocolate chips are the fentanyl. When you mix in fentanyl into another substance, it doesn't mix in evenly. It's gonna, you'll have little pockets here and there. And so if you buy one of those uh, blue pills I mentioned earlier, one of those M30s on the street, and go share it with a friend, and you split it exactly in half, you're not guaranteeing that each of you is gonna receive an even split of the drug. One half could very well contain 90% or more of the fentanyl that's in the pill, and the other half could contain 10 or less. You, know, you just don't know. There are some tools like fentanyl test strips that some syringe service programs hand out, which are, you know, good at detecting presence of fentanyl, but not purity. So it won't be able to, they won't be able to tell you exactly how much is in the, in the drug they tested, but if tested properly, it will tell you if fentanyl is in the drug that you're about to use. Now you don't want to use those for testing uh, stimulants though, because the margin for error, um, you know, the fact you might get a uh, false positive is very likely. So if you have fentanyl test strips or if you distribute those at your agency, please advise the folks that you're giving them to, they should not be used for testing stimulants, okay? Or if they do test stimulants, take the results with a grain of salt, all right? Ron, we have a question about sure. fentanyl test strips. Um, yeah, question is, how is the new federal permission to pay for fentanyl test strips being rolled out? Well, my understanding is that, you know, federal funds are now allowed to be spent on the purchase of fentanyl test strips. Um, 
As far as the rolling out and the disbursement of funds, I can't say for sure. That would be a question for your, you know, your, your, your granting agency like SAMHSA, most likely. Um, so speak with your funder and ask, you know, if the funding that you receive um, can be spent on fentanyl test strips. If it's federal, I would like to say most likely you can spend it on test strips, but yeah, that's not a question I can get. That's not something I can guarantee that you have to speak with your funder. Sure. Thank you. Sure. And yeah, I did want to pause right here because I know I've gone over a whole bunch of stuff really early and I do want to pause and make sure that I can address any questions that are in the group. That was all in the Q&A. Um, okay. So feel free to yeah. keep going. And, and just a reminder, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A box. Sounds good. Sounds good. So we'll keep rolling. So overdose trends. Um, these are primarily what we're seeing here in Washington, but um, you know, some of these could be applied nationwide as well. Um, again, the biggest one being the rise in illicit fentanyl. Um, and again, the half-life, um, this has had a huge effect on how our, our, um, our folks who use drugs, how they use their drugs. Because what we've seen over the past uh, year or so with the way fentanyl has made its way into the street level drug supply, with its half-life, meaning the length of time it takes for half of the drug to be processed through the person's system, folks who have transitioned to using fentanyl from, you know, say there used to be heroin users before, they, they have to use more throughout the day and night to stave off withdrawal symptoms. And so someone who might have been a heroin user, you know, they might have to maybe, let's say they're an injection heroin user, maybe have to inject, what, seven to 10 times a day to stave off withdrawal, depending on the strength and purity of what they're using. Now that they've transitioned to fentanyl, many of them have to use twice as often or even more. And so what this has done is that folks who were injection users, many of them have blown out their veins and many of them didn't have very good access to begin with. But what we're seeing is that, you know, many folks are having to transition to smoking because they simply have no vein access left due to having used fentanyl so often throughout the past year. And this in turn has led to um, some SSP, some certain service programs reporting a decrease in the number of participants they see because they don't, some places don't offer smoking supplies. And, you know, if they don't have the supplies that they need, you know, many of them, many drug users simply won't go to their, go to them. However, we do have some certain service programs here in the state that do offer smoking supplies, um, which we're fortunate about. Another trend that we're seeing is that poly substance use is rising, uh, poly meaning more than one. And this applies primarily to folks who used to identify as opioid only users. What we're seeing now is that many of them are also using stimulants, primarily methamphetamine. Um, methamphetamine out here on the West Coast is, you know, for the most part, um, the main stimulant. I realize back East, um, it's, it's probably cocaine. Um, in the Midwest, it's probably a coin flip. Um, but yeah, many folks are now reporting using methamphetamine either before or after or during um, when they use their opioid. This could be for a number of reasons. Um, you know, one is the price. You know, we're, we're told that methamphetamine, the price has dropped considerably. Um, it's really easy to access. It could also be because folks who are living homeless um, they might have to take methamphetamine at night to stay up and awake um, to make sure that they don't, they don't get robbed or attacked. That does happen. Um, it could be the reverse. It could be you know, folks who use opioids at night to sleep and then take, take a stimulant like methamphetamine during the day to go to work and, and take care of business. Who knows? A uh, good trend that we're seeing though here in Washington is that naloxone is now widely available. Um, I apologize for those of you who can hear the barking dogs. Um, I'm working from home and we have about seven dogs that live here and around us. So please bear with me. Um, I hope I'm speaking loud enough. Um, 
No, yes, we are. Thanks, Sean. <laughs> Uh, we we are seeing the um, you know really increased access to naloxone all across the state, and that's for a couple of different reasons. Um, one is that our all of our state Medicaid plans reimburse the, the, the customer for the for the out of pocket cost of naloxone. Um, all of our Costco locations, Safeways, Rite Aids, and Albertsons, they all dispense naloxone without a prescription. So if you're here in Washington, you can go to any of those um, any of those businesses and obtain the naloxone kit from their pharmacies without a written prescription. Another good trend that we're seeing is that in 2010, we enacted our uh, Good Samaritan law. Many of you might be familiar with this law and those of you who are not in Washington, um, your state might very well have your own version of it. Um, this law here in Washington protects individuals against process, against uh, possession of personal amounts of drugs. If they are at the scene of an overdose or if they are the person who overdosed themselves, um, protects uh, underage individuals against possession of alcohol. There are a couple caveats, a couple uh, you know disclaimers to, the, to our state's good SAM law. One is that it does not protect the individual if they have Department of Corrections supervision or an active warrant. Uh, meaning like per, if they're on probation or parole and law enforcement shows up and they run their name, um, there is the possibility that they, they could get violated and taken in. Um, or if there's things at the scene like uh, scales that have been used to weigh out drugs or unregistered firearms, uh, or in the case of controlled substance homicide. That is a law that we have here in Washington that states that let's say hypothetically, I were to administer or sell a drug to someone and then that person overdoses and dies from that drug, I can be charged with controlled substance homicide. And the Good Samaritan law does not protect me against that. In 2015, we enacted our state's naloxone law. And that law simply states that anyone here in Washington who is at risk of witnessing or experiencing an overdose can carry and administer naloxone. And in 2019, we enacted our uh, statewide standing order. That standing order does two primary things. One is it acts as a prescription for someone to go and obtain a naloxone kit from a pharmacy if they don't have access to a primary care provider who can write a prescription for them. And then two, it allows agencies and nonprofits, organizations who don't have a medical provider on site, it allows them to receive naloxone and distribute it. And so that statewide standing order has really helped increase access and distribution of naloxone because many organizations here that work with active drug users or those who are at risk of overdose, you know, simply don't have a medical provider. You know, places like, you know, think like a housing first agency. Um, you know, they're most likely not going to have a doctor on site, right? And so th those have really helped increase access. So how do we get here? You know, um, this chart here and the and the following chart sort of represent, you know, how how we got to this point in time. But I want to go back a couple of years. I want you to think back to the mid '90s, 1996 or so. Something happened right? Pain began to be recognized as a vital sign. You know, think about when you go to see the doctor or you're at the ER and the nurse or the doctor asks you on a scale of one to 10, how's your pain? Or they show you that chart with all the faces, you know, the happy faces and the sad faces, and they ask you to point to which one you are at, the, at that time. They didn't always do that. This came about, you know, in, in the mid nineties. Um, it was pushed for and advocated for, by my understanding, uh, by the Veterans Administration. But, you know, the pharmaceutical industry also had a hand in it. And so with this new recognition of pain came new pain medications, primarily Oxycontin. Many of you are familiar with Oxycontin. Um, it was marketed and promoted as a non-addictive opioid-based pain medication because it had a time-released coating on it, meaning you would take the pill and because it had this coating, it would be absorbed into your system over the course of hours, you know, six, eight, 
10 hours or so, depending on the, the, the strength of the pill. They were sold in, in milligrams, you know, 10, 20, 40, 80, um, and even higher. And what happened? Well, doctors began prescribing this pill. Many, many people began taking this pill. Online pharmacies popped up, meaning you could go, you could go on, and this was in the early days of the internet. You could go online and if you had a credit card and you had internet access, you could go find one of these online pharmacies. You would never see a doctor, but you would just type in, you know, you'd answer the questions they had for you on the screen. And hey, a couple of days later, your pills would arrive. Uh, the FDA and the DEA caught on to those fairly quickly and those got shut down. I don't think you're gonna have very much luck finding an online pharmacy nowadays that will prescribe opioids um, without having seen a physician. Um, once those got shuttered, we saw the, the proliferation of what were called pain management clinics. Um, those were, you know, primarily down in the Southeast. You know, you can go on YouTube and find a lot of videos about them. Um, HBO did a great series, a great two-part series called Crime of the Century that I highly recommend you watching. Um, and these pain management clinics basically operated as a really easy way to obtain opioid-based pain medication and also other pills, anti-anxiety pills like Xanax and Valium. FDA and DEA caught on to those fairly quickly <laughs> and those, <clears throat> those were shuttered you know, mid, early, mid 2000s. And so what happened? Well, now you had nearly a decade of people who had been taking opioid based pain medication, who had developed that physical need that I talked about earlier. And now they were cut off. What do they do? Well, they had the physical need. They went and turned and found the most readily available form of opioids. And for many of them, that was heroin. And so if we follow the blue line and the gray silver line there, you can see 2000 to 2008 or nine or so, you know, the prescription opioid overdoses spike. Heroin overdoses, which are the gray line, stay relatively flat. Around 2010, prescription opioid, prescription opioid overdoses start decreasing heroin overdoses start increasing at a nearly identical rate. Many of us saw this coming. Um, you know, it could have been, if not avoided, it could have been handled in a much different way. You know, patients could have been informed um, about the risks associated with opioid medications. That's not to say they didn't deserve to take them. Many, many people absolutely positively need opioid medications to get through the day and night. I will not deny that whatsoever. However, the physicians that were prescribing them might have presented the facts about the physical need that they would develop in a much more truthful manner. And they could have been tapered, you know, rather than cut off immediately. So this leads to where we're at today with, in 2020, we saw a 37% increase, 37 increase in overdose deaths here in Washington, uh, primarily due to fentanyl. And that's, you know, what we expect the, the primary source to be, you know, moving forward. Um, mainly, well, for a couple of reasons. One is that fentanyl is synthetic. We've eliminated the need for Southeast Asia and Afghanistan. You know, we don't need poppies anymore. If you have the chemicals and the knowledge and the space to make it, you can create fentanyl. And, you know, think back to the, uh, the sugar packet metaphor. You know, how many packets of sugar do you need to provide enough opioids to your city, right? Um, Yeah, the economics of it, you know, um, Christine, you know, mentioned, you know, Christine asked a question earlier about, you know, how do 
you know, racial and social, socioeconomic um, factors. How do they, um, how are they affected by opioids? Well, poverty is imp impacts use. You know, people take opioids to feel better. Um, you know, they can alleviate hunger in many, many people. You know, you don't need to eat very much when you're taking opioids throughout the day and night. Um, COVID-19 has just been a, you know, has just been a magnifying glass for all of the inequities that our country, our state and country have been dealing with, you know, pre-COVID. And COVID just, you know, showing a big fat flashlight on them. Um, due to the fact that we've been encouraged to isolate over the past year and a half, um, that, you know, I don't have data in front of me to support it, but, you know, common sense dictates that um, it has had an effect on the overdose rate because if you're using a loan, no one's around to give you naloxone if you were to overdose, right? Um, and of course, the depression and the anxiety that COVID, you know, causes in, in some people um, leads them to use substances to take away, you know, the, the mental and emotional pain. Um, opioid dealing is very, very profitable. You know, you can make a lot of money from this stuff, you know. Uh, for some, it's generational, you know, their father and their mother and their father and grandfather and sister um, we're all in the business, and for some, it's the only option to make a living wage. You know, given the choice to go work for minimum wage for 40 hours a week and come home with a couple hundred dollars each week, or to go out on the street corner and work for a couple hours and make the same amount of money tax free, you know, what would you choose? And then with fentanyl, you know, it keeps coming back to fentanyl, but you know, it's changed everything. Um, you know, you combine fentanyl with the internet and the fact that many people use the internet and social media as a source to obtain drugs now, you know, with Instagram. And um, yeah, it's a, you know, the game has changed. We're dealing with many things that we um, haven't had to deal with in the past. And it's gonna take some ingenuity to, um, to make sure the harms aren't perpetuated. Um, yeah, like I said, I, I apologize, but we're not going to have the time to talk about stimulant overdose today. Um, regarding using a loan, this organization here, um, it's one way to um, address having to use a loan. Uh, it's an organization called, ironically enough, Never Use a Loan. Um, you can call them and the operator will stay on the line with you for a chosen length of time. And if you happen to not respond to that operator while you're on the line with them, they will call for EMS to come out to you and assist. It's not a perfect fix, but it is something. So let's get to the nitty gritty of overdose and opioid overdose specifically. What will naloxone work on? It'll work on any opioid. Doesn't matter if you bought it on the street, got in the pharmacy, whatever. If it has opioids in it, naloxone will help if you overdose on it. It's not going to work on anything else. All right. So if you if you overamp from cocaine or if you overdose from a benzodiazepine like Xanax or Valium, it's not going to help you. However, and this is a big however, if you see the signs and symptoms of an opioid overdose, but you thought the person only took cocaine or they only drank some alcohol or they only took some meth, treat it as such. Okay, go ahead and give them naloxone. It will not hurt them whatsoever. If they don't have opioids in their system, it's not going to do a thing. You know, they might get a tiny headache, but that's going to be it. Okay, because if they, if, you know, they took some methamphetamine per se, and they demonstrate the signs and symptoms of an opioid overdose, that methamphetamine very well might have had some fentanyl in it. And so if you give them naloxone, you might save a life. Okay, so again, if you see the signs and symptoms, treat it as such, no matter what you think the person might have taken. Those signs and symptoms, the big three are gonna be blue fingernails and blue lips or ashy white lips on a person of color, struggling or no breathing, 
Some people call it a death rattle because again, the breathing's shutting down. They're gonna be trying to breathe. They might make a snoring sound or a, like a minor coughing or choking sound. And also if they're unresponsive to stimuli, meaning you're shaking their shoulder or slapping them or screaming their name, all right? One or any combination of these signs and symptoms, you know you need to act. So again, say these to yourself so you have them in your head. Blue fingernails and blue lips or ashy white lips on a person of color, struggling or no breathing, and being unresponsive to stimuli. One or any combination of these three. So how do you respond? Well, you are not John Travolta and you are not injecting anything into anyone's heart, all right? Get Pulp Fiction out of your head, people. For those of you who don't know, this is taken from the, the film Pulp Fiction back in the mid nineties. John Travolta there, the guy in the black suit is responding to the woman on the floor, Uma Thurman, who was um, overdosing from heroin. And Travolta is about to inject what appears to be a very large syringe full of adrenaline into her heart. For the record, that does not work, okay? And if you're gonna inject naloxone into somebody, you do not inject it into their heart, you inject it into their upper outer thigh, okay? So what do you do? You look for the visual signs. You just went over them on the last slide. You should be saying to yourself, blue fingernails, blue lips, ashy white lips, no breathing, unresponsiveness. Check for a response if you see those signs. Easiest and best way to do this is to do a sternum rub or a sternum tap. You take two knuckles, your pointer knuckle and your middle knuckle, and I want you to try this out on yourself, okay? Take those two knuckles, rub and tap on the person's sternum. Do this on yourself though to try it out. Rub and tap as hard as you can, all right? It really hurts, right? If you do it hard enough, okay, do that for 10 seconds to the person. You can also shout their name if you want to. If you do that for 10 seconds, hard enough, one of two things is gonna happen. Person, if they're not overdosing, you're gonna get up and say, stop, that hurts. If they are overdosing, they're not gonna do anything. They're not gonna respond, they're not gonna say a word. So if they don't respond, what you do next is depends on what is closest to you, okay? So you either call 911 or administer the first dose of naloxone next. If your phone is right next to you and your naloxone is upstairs or out in your car, you call 911 while you're running to get naloxone, all right? If your naloxone is right next to you, but your phone is upstairs or out in your car, give the person the first dose of naloxone and then go get the phone and call 911, all right? I say this because traditionally, we would say call 911 first and then administer naloxone. But what we've learned is that sometimes 911 operators wanna talk a lot and we don't wanna delay getting that first dose of naloxone into the person, okay? So do what you feel is easiest in that moment, all right? Sean, we have a, a couple of questions. Um, Absolutely, what's up? One is, was the nodding that you mentioned earlier um, only a symptom of fentanyl or opioids perhaps, or could it be another substance that someone has got on board there? Typically it would be an opioid. Um, that's not to say someone wouldn't nod off on something like uh, Xanax or even alcohol, or they could just be tired, who knows? Yeah, um, okay. But the nod, you know, typically will be associated with opioid use. Sure. And another question, well, we have this in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. Has have people had to have multiple naloxone doses in yeah, in one yes. overdose? Yes, and I'll, I'll get to that here. In, okay, great. Oh, I perfect. Think the next so we'll slide get... or the one right after. Yeah. Perfect. All right, great. I'll let you keep going. Okay. Okay. So again, do whatever is easiest for you in that moment. All right, but you want to get that first dose of naloxone into the person as soon as possible. Right. To do that, well, let me back up a second. To do that. Um, let's assume you have uh, nasal naloxone, otherwise known as Narcan. Um, you're going to take this out of the, whatever kit container you have it in. Sometimes they're in blue zip baggies. Sometimes it's just in the box. It'll, uh, the device will be in a little plastic seal. Take it out of that. You're going to get the person ideally flat on their back. 
but if they're sitting in a seat or a car seat, it's okay for right now. Hold the device just like this with your thumb on the, on the bottom on that little plunger and your fingers on the opposite side of the nasal insert. Tilt the person's head back, insert it straight up a nostril, doesn't matter which one, as far as your knuckles will allow. Push hard on the plunger, count to three, just to make sure they absorb all the spray. There's not a whole lot in here, so you wanna make sure they get it all. One, two, three. Take it out and you're done with that. You give everything at once, all right? So one, two, three, you're done. After that, you're gonna do rescue breathing. Now, I know the idea of doing mouth to mouth on someone that you know or don't know can be kind of weird, even in non-COVID times. And now that we're living in COVID times, it can be even stranger. Um, so uh, do what you feel is the safest for you. Um, however, I can't stress the importance of rescue breathing enough because again, their breathing shut down. This is what we're trying to revive. So if you feel comfortable with doing rescue breathing, please do so, okay? To do this, you will get the person flat on their back, tilt their head back. You're gonna kneel right alongside them. So you're you know, facing them perpendicular. I guess, yeah, be the term. Kneel right next to them, tilt their head back, pinch their nostrils, give them two short mouth to mouth breaths. Make sure you see the chest rise, okay? If the chest does not rise or if the stomach rises or if nothing rises, you know you need to readjust, okay? So open the person's mouth, check their airway. There's a chance they might have vomited or they might have something blocking their airway. You might have to roll them onto their side, scoop something out, get them back on their back and just start over, okay? Tilt the head back, pinch the nostrils, two short breaths. Once you see that chest rise, you know you're in the right spot. Give the person one full breath every five seconds. Again, that's one full mouth-to-mouth -mouth breath every five seconds. Continue this process for three minutes. I strongly suggest that you use a timer, if at all possible, because three minutes can seem like an eternity if you're not using a timer, okay? And you don't wind up giving the person too much naloxone. Now, we want to give them just enough to bring them back because naloxone can, can cause withdrawal symptoms in a lot of folks, okay? So you don't wanna give them too much too fast because there's a chance, and I'll touch on this in, in the next slide, that they might fall back into an overdose in, you know, an hour or two from now, and you might need that extra dose then, right? So use a timer if at all possible. Wait three minutes. If there's been no response, no change, meaning the person hasn't started talking, they haven't started visibly breathing, haven't started moving around or walking around, Give the person the next dose of naloxone, exact same way. If you wanna do the opposite nostril, that's fine. And just continue that process. Continue on with the rescue breathing. Every three minutes, if there's been no response, give another dose of naloxone, okay? Continue that process until EMS shows up. Once EMS shows up, let them know what you get, let EMS know you know, how many doses of naloxone you gave them, what you think the person might have taken to cause the overdose, and any other steps that you might have taken, like CPR or chest compressions or whatnot. Now, I wanna go back to this, touch on chest compressions real quick. Um, I do get the question a lot, you know, do I need to do full on CPR, meaning chest compressions as well? Uh, that's conditional. Um, if you got to the person right when they fell into the overdose state, focus on the breathing, focus on the rescue breathing, okay? Because their heart will still be pumping for a short length of time. And so they'll still be getting blood throughout their body. However, if you get to the person, you know, five or 10 minutes after they've fallen into an overdose or you don't know how long they've been in an overdose state, do whatever you can whatever you know, whatever is at your disposal. So if you know how to do CPR, please do it, okay? But if you're gonna focus on anything, focus on the rescue breathing. That's, that's one of the most important steps you can take. And if you don't have naloxone available, simply do rescue breathing, okay? 
I've seen and heard of people being kept alive before, you know, while EMS was on the way from rescue breathing alone during an overdose. So um, can't stress the importance of that step enough. But again, I know we're living with COVID. It's a tricky matter. If you don't want to do it, I don't think anyone's going to get angry with you. Once the person wakes up, and let's assume this happens before EMS gets there, or for some reason you did not call 911, okay? Stay with them. Naloxone will not kick the drug they took out of their system. It's just going to attach to those brain receptors, and it kicks the opioids off. And then once naloxone wears off, which can be a half hour to 90 minutes or so, whatever drugs they still have in their system can make it back to the brain and reattach. And there's a chance they can fall back into an overdose without even having taken any more drugs, right? So stay with them as long as possible and keep naloxone available, all right? There's a chance they might fall back into an overdose state. Don't let them take any more drugs because there's a strong possibility that the naloxone is gonna cause them to feel some withdrawal symptoms, especially if they've been using opioids for a length of time. They're gonna to wanna to take more opioids to try to get well and get rid of those withdrawal symptoms. Don't let them do it, right? Because one, they still have naloxone in their system. So whatever they take is gonna get blocked. And then two, once the naloxone does finally wear off, now they have additional drugs in their system and there's an even greater chance they'll fall back into an overdose. So don't let them do it. They'll get well on their own. It's just gonna take a little bit of time, right? And then lastly, if you're unsure about their condition at all, take them to the emergency room, all right? They might have something going on internally that you don't know about or even they don't know about, okay? So if, if you can convince them to go to the ED, please do so, all right? Um, pause right here. I see the number three up on the Q&A. We, yeah, we have um, probably four questions. So okay. what I do want to say is that we are going to make a Q&A and resource document after this is over. So we will make sure all the links we've been throwing around in the chat and all the questions that people have asked, whether or not we um, got to it live in the session, we'll make sure to spell that out and ask Sean to answer if he didn't get a chance to answer um, live. So we'll do our best. We are um, at 1138, so we'll go through what we can. What is Department of Health's role in educating the system to honor the validity of the standing order? And so hearing that some people are sometimes denied uh, that, even though that is a standing order. Yeah. Uh, great question. Um, as you can tell, the standing order is fairly new. You know, it, it went, it was act, uh, live in September of 2019. So we've been doing our best um, within our networks to get word out about it. Um, we just uh, released a revised version of it back in February. Um, so yeah, there are still some pharmacies out there that are, you know, playing catch up and learning about it. However, we've done... I like to think um, a pretty good job about getting uh, word out about it. You know, we have on our website, we have both, we have a version of it in English and in Spanish, and that's on our drug user health website. Um, you can find this by going to, if you just Google Washington state, uh, statewide standing order or Washington state drug user health, um, it'll take you to our uh, drug user health webpage where you can find the, uh, the link to the standing order. Um, we have a um, FAQ page on there in both English and Spanish that addresses some of the most popular questions that we receive regarding the standing order. Um, but yeah, we, we do hear on occasion that, you know, people sometimes have difficulty using it. Um, normally when I get, you know, I'll get notified by email or phone call and then I'll call the pharmacy and speak with the pharmacist and um, address any questions or concerns they might have about the standing order. Um, we've had some really good buy-in though from most of the corporate pharmacies, like, you know, when I mentioned earlier about Costco, uh, Rite Aid, Albertsons and Safeway, um, they all already had their own, um, means to dispense naloxone without a prescription in place, even before we had the statewide version. Right. So if your Narcan has expired, but you still have it available, what do you do? Use it. Use it. All right. Yeah. yeah. Short answer um, to that one. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, real briefly, um, 
the makers of Narcan, uh, Adapt Pharma slash Emergent Biosolutions. Um, last year, um, late last summer, they worked with the FDA to extend the expiration date for Narcan um, from 24 to 36 months. Now, they did not make that extended expiration date retroactive to all Narcan kits that are already in circulation. It only applies to kits that were you know, shipped with that date on it already. So, um, so please adhere to whatever expiration date you have on your kit. And this only applies to Narcan, no other form of naloxone, okay? okay. Um, however, studies have shown that if you keep naloxone, and this goes for any form of naloxone, nasal, injectable, auto injector, whatever. If you keep it stored properly, meaning out of the sunlight and at room temp, it can be viable for up to 30 years. That's three zero years post expiration. Okay, so if you have naloxone available and it's the only naloxone you have and it has expired and someone's overdosing, use it. All right. Okay. Great. Um, and how about, well, this is, I think, a simple question. How many doses are in Narcan? So in each Narcan kit that you buy, um, meaning you go to the pharmacy and you buy the, you know, the box of Narcan, there'll be two doses. So there'll be two of these in each box. All right. So each one of those is one. Each one of these is one dose and you yes. get the full right. thing each time you get, gotcha. you give one full spray, wait three minutes, give another spray if, if needed. Great. And uh, I think if you missed it, or maybe you have further about when people may need multiple doses, what was the final answer on it? It can happen. Yeah. Yeah. You just give as many as needed. I mean, at some point the person's going to fall into a coma. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I don't want to laugh. I mean, coma is right. anything to laugh about, but yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, at some point the person yeah. will, you know, respond. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully, the... hopefully respond. Yeah. But, yes. Okay. Um, but every three minutes. Given every three this. minutes. Okay, great. And then lastly, before we have to wrap up, and I know there were more, um, just a reminder, we will be sending, um, you know, having these slides available in PDF form and all the resources as well when we put the recording up. Um, okay. Is there a way, the last question, is there a is there a resource you would point to um, that would outline the steps that you shared on how to administer Narcan? I imagine there are. Um, what would you recommend people look to for a good resource on what you described in the webinar? Absolutely. Um, our Drug User Health webpage. Okay. And also, I'm going to touch on a couple here in just a second on the next slide. Okay. I'll let yeah. you do that. And then we sure. need to wrap up in about 30 okay. seconds. Yep. If there's, got <laughs> Thanks. It. You got it. We're going to speed through. So where do you find it? Well, the question uh, Christina just asked, North American Syringe Exchange Network and stopoverdose.org. Stopoverdose.org, fantastic resource for finding naloxone and for also learning about overdose response. So if you wanna find links to any videos, if you wanna find a link to our drug user health webpage, go there. Storage wise, keep it room temp, keep it out of the sunlight, pay attention to the expiration date, but don't throw it out, okay? If your kit expires, mark it use last or use second, hold on to it, but go out and get yourself a new kit. And then lastly, anything to consider as an agency, if you're going to keep naloxone at your place of business, you know, who's going to have access to it? Where will a kit be kept? You know, is there a log to document when it's administered or, you know, steps that we're taking if an overdose occurred on your property? The two biggest things I can stress on here is that who's going to be re responsible for keeping an eye on the expiration dates? and who's gonna be responsible for restocking the supply. You wanna make sure that you always have at least two doses on hand. It's fine to have more than two, but make sure you have at least two, okay? And that's it. Got in right, right at 11.45. <laughs> Excellent. <Bam. laughs> uh, that's awesome. Well, there is, um, we're going to go very quickly through our um, outro slides, but Sean, thank you so much. This was riveting. I think it's indicative that people just couldn't even think of a question while they're listening to your information. And so in the chat, there are some 
uh, links to some upcoming events that people might find useful. And also if we can put the survey in again, it just takes a couple of minutes. Your feedback is really, really uh, important. And so a couple of the events coming up is uh, one from the uh, AIDS Education and Training Center coming up on September 7th. And then our next event is in uh, September around suicide prevention and assessment. But just want to say thank you so much, Sean. This was really helpful, really a good reminder of, you know, how far we still have to come, but what things are, are out there and available and answering a lot of questions. So again, okay, we'll make you. a resource document and yeah, thank you so much for your time. Okay. Thanks Take everyone care. for joining us. Okay. Bye-bye.